To follow up on our discussion of the Hartree-Fock energy for atoms, we're now going to discuss Hartree-Fock operators. So to start off, our simplest operator is called the one electron operator. So for every electron, indicated by this index I, electron I has a one electron operator H, which is equal to its kinetic energy operator plus its potential energy operator that attracts it to the nucleus. So minus one half del squared I, kinetic energy of electron one, of elect sorry, of electron I, minus charge of nucleus over distance from the electron to the nucleus. It's the one electron operator, which gives us the one electron energy. Then there are things that depend on two electrons. These are our two electron operators and tell us how the electrons repel each other. So first we have the Coulomb operator, Ji acting on psi j for electron one, gives us psi j of electron one times the integral over all space of electron two. So we've got the psi star i, psi i of electron two in orbital i. So we got the charge density of electron two at a specific location divided by its distance from our electron one integrated over all possible locations of electron two. So this Coulomb operator gives us the effective mean field repulsion of electron one from electron two's charge density uh, integrated over all space. Then the second operator is the exchange operator, also a two electron operator. And I have to write things this way because here's what happens. The exchange operator is going to exchange the labels for orbital j and orbital i from inside and outside the integral. So exchange operator ki acting on orbital psi j gives us orbital psi i, with which r1 is now in. It's exchanged electron one to be in orbital i instead of orbital j. Now we integrate over psi star i times psi j of, of electron two. So now this is the overlap of orbital one and orbital two divided by the distance at each location of that overlap from our electron one integrated over all possible locations of electron two. So the effect of this exchange operator is gives us the same kind of integral as our Coulomb operator but it has exchanged the location of our electron. So these Coulomb and exchange operators are both two electron operators. They depend simultaneously on the position of two electrons, R1 and R2. All right, so these operators give us different expectation values once we, multi once we take that operator acting on a wave function and multiply it times the complex conjugate and integrate. We have HI, our one electron integral, integral over all space for electron one. Now we have multiplied by psi star I, and we have H acting on psi I. Our Coulomb integral, we take our Coulomb operator acting on psi J, multiply times psi J star, and then integrate over R1. Now we have our Coulomb integral, which is an integral over the, the coordinates of electron one and electron two minus infinity to infinity for x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2. Now we have psi star i, psi i of electron one, charge density of electron one, times psi star j, psi j, charge density of electron two, times one over r12, the distance between the charge density of electron one and electron two, integrated over all possible locations in space. All right, then we take that and we also have the Coulomb integral where we've taken our cool, sorry, the exchange integral where we've added our exchange operator. Then we multiply times psi star j and integrate with respect to R1. And that gives us the exchange integral. We're integrating again over all six dimensional coordinates, three of electron one, three of electron two. Psi star i, psi j times psi star j times psi j psi i, but we have exchanged the location of, orbit, of electron one to now be in orbital j instead of orbital i. 
So the exchange integral has exchanged our electron into a new orbital and giving us something which we don't have a nice clean physical interpretation to. So these are our one electron integrals. Those are our two electron integrals which arise from our one electron operator and two electron operators. So now we can combine these two to develop what is called the Fock operator. So we have Hartree -Fock and the Hartree Fock theory. We had Hartree products, and now we are calling this the Fock operator. So the Fock operator for electron one is equal to the one electron operator for electron one, plus the sum over all electrons, sum from i equals one to n for all the other electrons of the Coulomb operator for electron one minus the exchange operator for electron one. This t sum in parentheses here represents the effective, uh, the effective mean field operator that we discussed earlier in our hartree fock videos on helium. So the orbitals, the individual atomic orbitals that our electrons are in, those are actually eigenfunctions of the Fock operator. So the Fock operator acting on an individual orbital gives that orbital energy times the orbital again. So this is true for all n electrons. There are n electrons within n different orbitals with n different mean field Fock operators that they got from interacting with all the other electrons. So as I mentioned in the previous video, an electron doesn't interact with itself because Coulomb minus exchange for itself gives zero. So this, so this is actually giving us the interaction of the electron with every other with every other electron except for itself. So this Fock operator, this mean field operator is different in every electron because each electron inter interacts with every other electron except itself and then what's left over is every different orbital has a slightly different Fock operator giving a slightly different orbital and a slightly different orbital energy. So then our orbital energies can be computed by taking the integral over all space for our orbital. We have psi star i, complex conjugate of the orbital, times the Fock operator acting on that orbital, integrating from minus infinity to infinity in x1, y1, and z1. So our orbital energy, according to all these expressions, if we combine them, is then equal to the one electron energy, <coughs> equal to the one electron integral, or one electron energy for that electron, plus a sum from j equals one of the two electron integrals Coulomb minus exchange for every electron where jii equals kii and you remove the self interaction where this electron interacts with every other electron except itself. So here again we see if we sum up all the orbital energies we're not going to get exactly the total hartree fock energy for the atom. The sum from i equals one to n of all of all orbital energies is a sum of from i equals one to n of all one electron energies. That part is in agreement with the hartree fock energy. So every, every electron has its kinetic energy and its attraction to the nucleus. No, no disagreement there. Plus, we have a sum from i equals one to n and a sum from j equals one to n of the two electron integrals, Coulomb minus exchange for all this isn't all unique pairs, this is twice of all unique pairs. We get rid of the case where i equals j, so that part is, that part is removed, but we're, we're adding up an upper diagonal and a lower diagonal of a matrix here. So what we're doing is we're double counting, once again, the interactions of our, of our two electron integrals. So the, Hartree, the actual Hartree-Fock energy, we could either say this is a sum from j equals i plus one to n, a pairwise sum, or we could say it's a one half of the total double sum. So for our Hartree Fock energy, we disagree with our orbital energies in the two electron terms, but not in the one electron terms. In the two electron terms, the total Hartree Fock energy uh, is half of what is the sum of the orbital energies, which double counts these two electron interactions coming from the Coulomb and the exchange integrals.